and welcome to the Vino Karma Show. My name is Amanda Layden, and I am the host of the show. So as those of you who watch the show know, we talk to change makers, taste makers, winemakers, and we dig into not only the world of wine, but also the world of technology and innovation and really interesting things. So today we have a guest who is going to share with us a mix around her wine background and technology as well. So I'm really excited for this conversation because it's unlike any conversation we have yet to have. Today we have the fascinating Jennifer Williams Buckley, who has spoken all over the world on the fine wine market and conducted tastings of some of the world's finest wines with some of the best personalities in the wine industry. She also has over 20 years of investment experience as both a portfolio manager and sell side research analyst, which is going to be very interesting as we talk about her business. She also founded her first company, AOC Advisors, in 2012, from which the Vinolytics software emerged. We're going to talk to her today about her experience in finance, in working in London, and honing her expertise in both the wine industry and the investment industries. She also is a graduate of the Wine School Education and Trust, WSET, also where I went to school, so I love it, um, from the diploma program. So welcome to the show today, Jennifer. I'm really happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's morning in California. I know you're in London, so it's the Early evening for you. Early evening, wine <laughs> around the corner. That's yeah, right. this is the beauty of technology, which we're going to talk about today, that we can do these things regardless of what corner of the world you are in. So thank you. I know it's probably getting near happy hour time for you. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. So for those folks who aren't aware of you, can you share a little bit of your story and how you got into the wine industry? Um, and you know, what the catalyst was for starting particularly AOC Advisors? Sure. So I was fortunate enough to move to London in 1998 with a large investment bank. And while I was working in the city of London, I recognized that there were a lot of people sitting around me who kept using the word claret. And I thought, <laughs> claret, that's a color. What is that? And I became more and more frustrated by that and thought, oh, I need to figure this out. Um, so lo and behold, obviously it's Bordeaux and I thought, wow, I, I love wine and how would I not know that? And so while I was working away, uh, analyzing stocks and bonds, I also decided to enroll in the Wine and Spirits Education Trust program and educate myself a little better on the, the where's and how's and why's of wine. And um, that basically is what I did from... Uh, gosh, uh, early 2000s, and then finally graduated with my diploma in 2011. So when we moved back to the States, um, I thought there would be a nice opportunity to combine my finance ba background with my newly acquired accreditation in uh, wine. And so I started AOC Investment Advisors uh, conceptually to help uh, invest in wine in the US and trade wines. And um, that's what initially I did. That's great. Can you talk a little bit about that market, the, the fine wine market, and um, how you also go about um, helping your clients to really make sure that what they're investing in um, gives, gives them a return on their investment? Sure. So I'll, uh, I'll start by saying I don't actually believe that wine is a very good investment. I think that there is a... Um, <laughs> And I'll also say that the, the vast majority of my clients don't actually believe that they're quote unquote investing in wine. Um, but what they do know is that it, it is an asset and it has value. So that I think is something that has um, certainly evolved in the marketplace. And we can talk a little bit more about kind of what's happening in the NFT world and kind of why wine is an asset is something that's becoming a hot topic. Um, there is an exchange here that's been around for around 25 years. It's called the London International Vintners Exchange. And to their credit, they were extremely early in recognizing that if they could develop a marketplace where the trade could trade wine, that that would allow for a much more efficient and transparent market to develop. And to be perfectly honest, you know, the history of the fine wine market is the core of it has always been in London uh, based on the British obviously buying Bordeaux and Burgundy early on. And there hasn't been a, lot, a real uh, 
a lot of a great deal of transparency. Um, you know, wines would come in, you don't know how they're stored, you don't know what they're worth, you don't know really anything about them. And it actually, you know, the price is just created by whomever wanted to pay what they wanted to pay. So LiveX has been an excellent opportunity for the market to really evolve. And um, just in the last five years, particularly in the last two years, it's really become a global marketplace as U.S. retailers have become more involved. But to London's credit, you know, it's really cutting edge in terms of what it's been able to, to bring to the marketplace, mm. the global marketplace. Yeah, thank you for that education on that. Can you can you talk about how you leverage um, Vinalytics to help you know collectors and consumers really understand their portfolios and manage them? Yes. Yeah, so back to your question about wine as an investment. The the reality of wine is that it is an asset that uh, uh, you acquire over time and it dies. Like wine essentially is the only asset that goes to zero, right? It has a lifetime. So we try to encourage our investor, our investors slash asset uh, acquirers to look at wine as just that. You know, buy, but recognize that you have oh, you too have a certain lifetime. So if you think about it conceptually, like we're if we're acquiring wines for a client. And uh, they're 60 something, you know, the reality is you can only drink really about 300 plus bottles a year. So, you know, unless you're really going crazy and you've got a lot of friends and you just have a giant liver, <laughs> if you think about it, you know, a 3000 bottle seller is around eight years of drinking. So we try to encourage the management of acquiring wines, either older vintages or new vintages in the context of how old they are, but also in terms of thinking about their longer term estate management. So for example, you know, if you're 60 something and we're starting to buy you on premier 2020s now, the reality is you're going to be 70 and change when those kind of come into probably their prime values. So we try to buy uh, wines where they can enjoy it now for drinking and they can think about kind of where those wines will be over their lifetime, both for the wine and for them. And then a lot of our clients want to buy like birth wines for their grandchildren or you know, different events. And so that's another nice thing that we do. You know, we try to look at each part of the investment grade world and look at those vintages and then fill them in. So a client will say, you know, I want to spend $50,000 on this vintage over, you know, and each child will have their, their little slot, which I think is lovely. And I think it encourages, you know, an attachment to the asset and also helps them understand that wine is much more than an alcoholic drink. Um, and I should also say you know, that the investment grade wine market, the IGW market, is a relatively small market. It's about 10 billion, it's probably 15 billion now. Um, and it's predominantly Burgundy, Bordeaux, Italy, some California, some Australia, but the vast majority of it is Bordeaux just because they make so much wine and there's a clear secondary market for it. Mm. And that's really what we're buying. It's really, fa it's really fascinating to learn about. I think for the average consumer who's not necessarily spending $50,000 for a gift for a grandchild, um, it's really interesting to hear, you know, what people are um, putting their money into and what they believe is going to hold for, you know, 20, 40, 30, 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, it, in relative context, I think the the grandparent realizes there's value in the asset, but there's also value in that experience. So, and I'll say, you know, the average right now, Burgundy, to get a top investment grade wine there, you're probably going to spend somewhere between $3,000 and $5,000 a bottle. Uh, Bordeaux, you can probably get involved somewhere between $1,500 and $3,000 a bottle, although the top end can go higher, $510. So it, it's really challenging to establish a portfolio for less than $25,000. It just, it doesn't make any sense because you need to actually have, you have to buy in case you really want to buy original word cases. You want to buy from extremely reputable, preferably from the seller itself, from the chateau or the domain. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's not a, it's not exactly a, an asset that you can necessarily just pick off in, you know, round $100 lots. It's really, it's really interesting to talk about. Can you tell us, before we dig into some of the technology that you're seeing, can you tell us about some of the changes you've seen in the industry in the past several years and where you also see um, potential opportunities for innovation? Sure. So certainly, as I said, I think that the most exciting thing that's happening on, on this side and globally is the ability to have a more transparent market. So the, the LiveX exchange, I think, is super innovative just in terms of the pricing transparency and the ability to then move wines efficiently. You know, the biggest challenge in wine generally at the consumer level is just helping the consumer actually understand what they're buying. 
you know, people have taken on this challenge and whether it's apps or marketing, marketing like uh, wine searcher mm -hmm. or wine.com or different platforms have tried to make the ability for the consumer to understand the product easier. But the reality is that the wine market has more SKUs than t-shirts. So actually <laughs> trying to get your head around what you're buying is consistently a challenge. And I'm not actually sure at a scalable level that we'll ever see the consumer be able to to really get to grips with how vast the market is in a super efficient way. Mm -hmm. I do think Vivino is a great platform for bringing people together very efficiently with their technology, with their app, and then being able to sell back in because you're creating this community. Um, but the reality is that like bookstores, people want to go into the bookstore or they want to go into the packy and they want to kind of have that experience at the end of the day, at the end of the weekend to get into the weekend. And so I think that, you know, what's what the, the good things that have come out of COVID have certainly been this recognition, particularly in the United States that, oh, by the way, you can buy wine online and it can drop at your door. And as difficult as it is to buy wine across states and across different localities in some cases, the reality is that as long as you've been able to tap into a wine source, it pretty much has been able to get to your door, sadly, only with FedEx and UPS, but it gets there eventually, right? So, you know, that goes back to the last mile and the connectivity. You know, I think the U.S. has some incredibly Byzantine rules around wine and booze generally, which have made it exceptionally difficult for the consumer and have made it incredibly profitable for the distributor. And that's something that the consumer has not actually been able to participate in because they actually don't know what they're fighting. They don't know what that market is, and they don't know why those rules exist. So anything that we can do to make that market more transparent from a technology perspective, I think is terrific. You know, if someone is in Indiana and they want this wine and they can't get it at their package store, but they know that it's in Illinois, and then suddenly they realize that Illinois can't ship to them in Indiana, even though they're right across the border, then I think those technologies are super important. Um, in, the, in Europe and in the UK, you know, the UK is a super transparent market. It still is you know, pretty, pretty small and in terms of how it operates, but that's part of the beauty of it. I mean, there really is a lot of historic relationships that have been there for a long time, but there too, technology and logistics are starting to make this market much more efficient as well. And Brexit has not really helped anybody for sure. I mean, most of the merchants here and in the US are struggling to get their, their product. And, you know, we, we've created, we, the British, the, the Europeans and the Americans have created this very, um, you know, difficult tariff based regulatory base that uh, isn't doing any justice to people who work incredibly hard to make a product that takes over 12 months to, to make and to, to come to market. And if you think about how long it spends a barrel and then gets bottled, you know, it can be anywhere from five to seven to 10 to longer until that bottle is actually able to be consumed. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. Although technology has really helped particularly in these COVID times as consumers here in the States have been able to get, you know, uh, direct from seller door their wines. The thing that we don't think about a lot is how the legislation and um, the ridiculous laws really affects the entire value chain. Mm, so, sure. you know, it affects the folks who are working in the vineyards. So when you put a hundred percent tariff on French wines coming into America, um, it's, it's ridiculous. It's only hurting the vineyard worker and the small, you know, shareholder, the small plot of land, um, that the vineyard owner actually has. And so it's, it's, we really don't think about that in a bigger scale, you know, it's probably not hurting the big bulk wineries, but it is hurting those small, small wineries, as well as everything in that value chain. Yeah, it, I just feel that there's just not enough that the consumer knows about. And so, but it's such a vast country and such a a, uh, a, a beloved thing that is just part of, uh, you know, the process of just getting that six pack of beer or getting the new uh, hard seltzer. You know, there's a whole market that's so vast that it's just getting that versus kind of understanding where there are these boutique curated mm -hmm. incredible products that have great value and probably should be part of that kind of bigger commercial regulatory challenge. Yeah, I agree. I agree on that. And I think it is, it is a difficult, I mean, just think about, you know, how long you spent getting your diploma, understanding the wines of the world and the business angle of the wine industry and, and how long that actually takes. 
Um, and then we're expecting the consumer to understand this oh, yeah. really no. vast, really complicated yeah. industry. Yeah. It's- I mean, I, I do. Um, Dave Pearson, who's now running uh, Meadowood, who was at Opus One for a long time. He I, I find him very thoughtful and I really enjoy listening to him. And he made a very good point on the Wine, Wine Writer Symposium a couple of weeks ago that, you know, the consumer now really wants experiences and they want that to be a bigger part of the component of the value add. Yeah, especially when, you know, people know that they've been able to have access to the winemakers at home like this um, throughout COVID. And so why are they going to spend thousands upon thousands to, you know, here in America to, to fly all the way across the country to pay the tasting room fees to then yeah. not even see the winemaker? Um, That's it. Yeah. So it's, I think it's going to be really fascinating to see how these experiential pieces that we've been witnessing during this time really change the face of how um, the consumer kind of almost dictates what these even small wineries are doing. Well, that's it, right? Like it was very clear that COVID gave you the opportunity to tap right into the winemaker, like, you know, the one-on-one with hundred of your closest friends and you'll never be able to do that. So they're going to have to figure out how they make the value of that experience really resonate with the consumer, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. So how else should consumers be thinking about technology when it comes to making choices about the wines they drink, whether it be in their local corner store, um, in a in their local wine shop, or even in restaurants they go to? Yeah, I, I often, when I speak to large groups, start by saying, when you go in to buy your wine, think about where you want to be. You know, you, you go in a wine shop and you think, oh, I'd really like to be in South Africa. South Africa is lovely. So I, I'm always a big proponent of setting retail environments up by region, mm-hmm. uh, not necessarily sub-region, but certainly by country, because I think the consumer can get there pretty quickly. And then helping them understand when you go north to south or east to west, and then diving down to why, you know, the vineyard that's a little closer to the water. So I think there's some pretty simple geography mechanisms that resonate there's always the label, which of course tends to draw people. But I think there too, we can use the label in a more efficient way to tell our story. And some of my producers on my platform here where I'm importing wines, most beautiful labels, and they bring you, you know, whether it's a redwood that's carved out of wood in a silk screen or a portrait or an oil painting. I mean, it, it really, I do feel like the label should be an expression of place, but also an expression of the process itself. So between or uh, you know, among other things, you can set up the store and the shop to look like that and to tell the story and for the story to resonate. But at the same time, uh, you have to visually be able to, to get there with the consumer. And the easiest way to do that is either by the shape of the bottle, the color of the bottle or the label. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that, that viewpoint about you telling that story. I mean, wine is yeah. a story in and of itself. You know, there's people tied to it. It's not just something that gets into a bottle that we really enjoy drinking. There's people tied to it. There's place, there's provenance, there's yeah. everything like that tied to it. So let's talk about technology, some of this technology, which I know nothing about. Um, so distributed ledger technology, DLT, could be a game changer for the wine industry and agricultural generally. What are some examples of this, or if you could share some use cases with us so that those folks who are listening or watching really understand what this is and how we use it in everyday life? Sure. So um, DLT or distributed ledger technology is the underlying digital accounting platform for all digital currencies, essentially. So it's basically a a, a timestamp, a digital timestamp. So for example, if you had a digital ledger and you were in the vineyard and you started with, we planted the grape, bud burst happened on this day. It looked like this, this was when it happened. Then we go through the whole vintage, the whole process of it evolving. We picked the grapes on this day, we've timestamped that. And we know at every point in time what's happened along that process. And the quality and the quantity is all there. And so at any point you can go back and have that perfectly documented because it's, immu- it's immutable. You can never change a ledger. And that's the key to DLT technology. I think the commercial use case is both at the kind of everyday wine because you'll know kind of where it's coming from and the quality of it. And theoretically, you should be able to like track chemicals and all other things that might go into that. And certainly at the fine wine level, we need that provenance. Um, There's a woman in California now, she's had a product in the market for the last four or five years, I think. She was very early on um, to her credit of, tracking, I believe with, she'll take a snapshot of the label and the label will then 
be documented on the on the ledger. And so when that wine then trades in the secondary market, the new buyer can go back and see exactly where that mm. wine came from, when that stamp time, time stamp was. So it kind of creates a level of provenance and you know you can never erase it. It's there. Mm-hmm. However, <laughs> you know, the concept of a non non tangible, non fungible token is different. So while you're applying NFTs to trading a token that is represent that is a representation and that token is able to cha- trade because of the ledger in the US NFTs for wine make a ton of sense because of the regulatory environment mm-hmm. like i can't sell you a bottle of wine of fine wine unless i'm licensed as a retailer and you have to buy it from a retailer or you as the auction house have to be a retailer so for us to create a an exchange like livex or other and kind of get out of the get the auction houses out of the way. Theoretically, you I could tokenize the entire fine wine market and then have those tokens trade in the U.S. So I would sell the token, but I'm not physically buying the bottle. Mm-hmm. So for all intents and purposes, from a regulatory perspective, NFTs make a ton of sense for fine wine, ton of sense because of the regulatory environment. So um, yeah, I think that's super exciting. And I've had a lot of conversations with people about that. And I would love to see that come to fruition in some some way. I think that's really, really fascinating. I mean, obviously I hadn't thought about that. You're the first person that's talked to me about this and yeah. putting it into that perspective around, yeah, why wouldn't it make sense, especially, in the, well, I think, especially in this regulatory environment. And, you know, we continue to see people getting, fleeced through um, bottles of, you know, fill in the blank um, top wine, whatever that might be, that isn't actually that wine. Or, you know, even when you think about, if you think about the basics, like I think, I think about, you know, some, there was, I can't even remember which country it was, but, you know, people were dying because of a bottle of liquor that actually was, it was like ethanol or something. Um, And so, you know, there's just like basic uses for it, but also I think that technology using it for the collectible side of, of that as an asset is really fascinating. So how, any other ways you, you think that technology or in the future, with the future of wine technology will continue to, to impact the trade? Uh, I certainly think on the logistics side, hopefully things will become a little bit more efficient out of the Amazon craziness of the last couple of years. Um, you know, LiveX has created something called the LWIN, so you can essentially track how the, where these wines go and and uh, and you know move them very efficiently and put them in. So, like on my platform, for example, like my software is the only software that's tied. It's a mark to market product, so it's all tied to LiveX. Every single stop, every single wine, I always do that. Every single wine that's in there has its own ticker, mm-hmm. and that ticker changes every day. The price is really an average over fourteen days. But that's great because at any time my clients can open their spreadsheet, open their portfolio and be like, oh, yesterday I made, you know, a thousand dollars in my wines because the price is changing just like it would any exchange. So I, I feel that that is, um, it's, it's great to know just how these things evolve and the value that's added when you put it in the right environment and you, you know, it, there's just more, more transparency. But I, I think the technology is going to be, yeah, technologies like Vivino um, are important for that for building that community. But at the same time, you know, they're commercial businesses, and they they're kind of a a catch twenty two because the wines that are going to show up and that the community is going to promote are always going to be wines that are bigger production. Yeah, and those are the ones you're always going to see, right? So mm-hmm. Vivino is going to push you wines that the community is pushing because they're being pushed already, right? It's like the ultimate pushers app. So um, I feel, uh, you know, if we can develop technologies that allow the consumer to more efficiently find that, I'll call it more boutique smaller production wine and, and experience that in a way that is efficient, uh, then that's great. Whether or not that's going to happen, I don't know. <laughs> I hope so, but I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, you bring up a good point. I think for people who um, are listening, just to clarify, Jennifer has two businesses, one which is also um, importing and distributing in the UK. So as she is based in just outside London, um, she also sells to the on and off premise um, in the UK. And so can you talk a little bit about your portfolio that you have that you are um, selling in the UK? 
Yes. So I am an American wine specialist. All I want to do is bring the story of great wines that are being made in the U.S. to a market that hasn't necessarily had great experiences with U.S. wines. Um, there's nothing wrong with a $200 Napa cab, but you know, that's what people sort of believe is the the American vision for wine, very big alcohol, very big cabs, very expensive. And then you've got the opposite side, which is no offense, Gallo slash Constellation maybe now, um, you know, barefoot, just that's what's in the marketplace. And so our wine portfolio is um, relatively small producers, anywhere from 90 cases to 5,000 cases. We have one producer who's relatively large and relatively well-known, but um, tremendous winemaker and, uh, just really interesting wines, but so the portfolio is really about wines from definitive places and varietals that express their place. So we may, for example, have a Viognier from the West, West coast of Sonoma, and that thing's going to be as lean and acidic and interesting that you of any Viognier you've ever tasted. And it's not going to be from the Northern Rhone, but it's going to be expression of its place and it's going to be beautiful and clean and, you know, all my wines, that's what we've really tried to do. And the winemakers that we work with are, are friends and real people and really committed to their their wines. And most of them make make wines for very big wine makers. Um, you know, that's their day job and their life job is our wines, are our wines. And uh, so, so yes, the vast majority of them are California. We have one from Oregon. We're bringing in some Washington, but, you know, it's San Luis Obispo, it's Santa Cruz Mountains, it's Monterey. Very cool old vine production from uh, Napa, uh, like really super interesting stories from Napa. I've been extremely excited to find these incredible wines that you would never know are there um, from winemakers that are just fully committed to making sure that it, the, this is a terrible thing to say, but kind of the Disneyland that has kind of become wine mm -hmm. in that part of the world is really not, or the, 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 the adult beverage you know playground uh, in Napa makes incredible wines. It's a beautiful place. And I love the people there, but the reality is there are some really, really interesting wine stories there that aren't part of that kind of bigger branded messaging. And that's been super exciting to, to bring Napa to people here in a way that they're not necessarily used to. And then of course, Sonoma, I mean, so the stuff coming out of the wines coming out of some uh, Sonoma are, in my opinion, as diverse as they get, like from the varietals to the expressions of place to the altitude, towards out to the, to the ocean. And I, you know, I think a lot of people have discovered that the price of grapes in Napa is no longer a viable option. Mm -hmm. And so they've needed to spread their wings and go and find some grapes that make a little bit more sense. But, you know, even as you go North, you know, go up to Lake County, go, there's some really exciting varietals that are, I mean, it's fascinating, you know, and all the, whether there's a Shannon or an Albarino or a um, Palangina. I mean, there's just a lot of really interesting varietals that are coming up and down that are great varietals that are not necessarily indigenous, but in fact, they're really expressive of their place and show show the place more than they do, you know, traditional varietal expression. Yeah, I'm really excited for you um, with that in the UK. I think, you know, you know, I lived in the UK for a decade, yeah. uh, worked in the wine trade over there. And um, I will say that, you know, when I came back to the States, I really didn't have any knowledge of American wine. And yeah, uh, because, thing. you know, living in London, you just, you <clears> get, <throat> as you were saying, it is like the Mecca for getting um, some of the best wines in the world. It's still the place where you mm. can taste everything except for American wines. <laughs> um, right. And so I'm still, <clears throat> I'm still learning and I'm excited as you talk about, particularly as you're talking about California, because I'm based here in California um, and we moved here during COVID. We haven't been able to explore all of the vineyards we want to explore. I'm excited also to hop over the border into Mexico to, to go to Valle yeah. de Guadalupe um, and really see those producers and what they're they have to offer as well, but I'm with you. I think there's so many exciting stories coming out of a lot of areas, um, particularly, of, you know, of California. And I know the last time we spoke, I I'd just been up to Santa Barbara County. Yeah. Um, and there's just a lot of cool wine up there too. So I love what you're doing. And, um, I think it's going to be really interesting to shift to, to like be that, um, you know, voice of change of shifting the Brits perspective around what America has to offer from a wine yeah, perspective. No, I, I, I don't um, underestimate the challenge. Let me put it that way, but I've been pleasantly surprised by um, the support from the trade and the support from the press and the support generally um, in the understanding that there's some pretty exciting wines that are coming out of the U S which is great. That's going to be a lot of fun. 
it's going to be great fun. And I really hope that at some point we can get back over uh, to the UK and we can, we can meet up with you and taste and uh, yeah, be terrific. <laughs> that and would we'll be great. Table at 67 Pall Mall and yeah, there we'll you go. It up and it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> that would be great. So a, a kind of off piece question, you know, what we've talked about, a lot of what we've talked about um, are really kind of the, you know, pre- it's the premium side of wine. Yes, the technology can be used for all sides of wine, but really who you work with are those folks who want to have an asset that's collectible. Can you talk a little bit more? And that, you know, can sometimes lend itself to a little bit of exclusivity in the trade. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you think the industry could be more welcoming to women and people of color and also bringing them up kind of through the, through the ranks of the industry, so to speak? I just think wine generally has always been in the domain of, it doesn't do itself any favors, right? Like it should be, so it's, it's intimidating to anyone and everyone. It Mm -hmm. just is, and it shouldn't be. And I think that the industry itself doesn't do a good job because there's this level of, even if you're just go to buy, you know, your average uh, barefoot, right. You're still like, mm, what is this? You know? And it's like, you look at the price point and you think, Oh, but you still have to think about what you're drinking. Right. And then you have to think about, well, where, but do you really want to think about where it's from? So it's a, like a long winded way of saying that I don't think the industry has done a lot of favors for the consumer generally, regardless of their stripes. Mm-hmm. And certainly at that level, like every other industry, you know, it's been heavily male dominated. And I think at the highest level of the industry, and I'm just talking about investment grade wine generally, has been controlled by this nuance of having to know X, Y, and Z. And that's kind of been like the male domain, like the golf club and everything else. And so the process of um, being able to go into a a, com- a comfortable or safe environment has been very challenging and it's still very challenging to go into a restaurant or, you know, a, s- a store and make a decision. I'm, at, I'm sure you have the same experience where you're either in a restaurant or you're in a never, they hand the wine menu to your husband still, or they just kind of look at you, even if it's David, like, it's like, there's just an assumption that he's going to know, yeah. right. Or somebody's going to know. And so I think there are better ways that the hospitality industry generally could make the consumer much more comfortable. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer about how you structure your list, but I do think that some people are doing a good job of helping the consumer relate to it either by region or by without making it too overly complicated. And this is probably a totally different show that you should do at some point, but the descriptors that we use for wine oh. are ridiculous, right? Yes. Like even I sit there and I'm like, uh, no, like this is, this is what I see. This is what I think. This is what it tastes like. Like it should be four things, which starts with good, bad, no, yes, yuck, yay. And then let's work into why that is. And everything about tasting or, or experiencing wine should be experiential, but I don't think we're doing a, a good, look, we as an industry on the hospitality side, on the sales side, on the production side are not doing a good enough job of having this amazing product be part of the conversation. And I think Europe generally does a much better job across the board because it's a much bigger part of the culture, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's just an everyday experience. It's a food product, which is what it is. And I get that it's a big commercial business and there's super ultra premium and there's your everyday bump. But the reality is everybody should be super comfortable with what they're buying as a product. Yeah. And um, I don't know what the answer is, except that we need to do a better job of helping people have really positive experiences about the product itself. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I don't have an answer. I really don't. And I don't think anybody does, but I do think that helping people get comfortable with learning about wine is the key to it all, right? It's like everything. It shouldn't be intimidating, but it's an intimidating thing regardless of, of where you sit on the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. I think part of this too is around access and equity, you know, who, who, who gets access to what rooms, who gets access to the learning, who can afford to yeah, have the oh, learning. For sure. I mean, come um, on, the average ticket to get into a tasting room in Napa is $75. Yeah. Right. Like, and even if we're talking about the longevity of the industry itself, let's just take sex and race out of the equation. Let's just talk about age, right? Like the average socio-demographic there is if we want 
if we want the 20 to 35 group to stop drinking hard seltzer and kicking back cocktails, then we need to make that a bigger part of their experience, their life experience, right? Like you need to be up there and make that a great value add and help that experience, help them help themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's part of the story. And we as an industry are not doing a good enough job with that. Like it should not be as quote unquote exclusive as it is. And it doesn't need to be exclusive. It just doesn't. No, sorry. I mean, even, even running in this space, there's so many things that we, we don't know. Like there are things that go on in the background. We're like, how could that possibly cost that? Right. Like how, like just doesn't make any sense. And this, you know, the concept of the mailing list is just absolute brilliance, right? Like it's just, but at the same time, I can assure you that there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of wine that's out there and available. And why can't we make those wines more understood by people who at some point, you know, will be your customer, but help them understand why it's $150 or help Mm -hmm. them understand why that little spot on, I don't know, Mount Beater is super, super special. And yeah. those grapes are like drinking gold. So I, I just think we do, don't do a, a good enough job of helping people understand why there's that, that range and what, what that actually means. But if we're, if we're not willing to create a really good entry-level value add where you can then upsell, but more importantly, up-educate, then we're all doomed, really. We're all just going to continue <laughs> to like question it. Like, well, and I love, but my favorite thing is like, if people come back to you like, oh my God, I just had this $150, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, no, like they can't really understand it other than that price tag and the place, like, like where it's from or, or who the producer is, but they can't go to that next level. And so we're, we're, we're not doing a good enough job. I mean, you know, we don't want the wine industry to turn into Nike. Right. But the reality <laughs> is in some respects, it kind of is moving that way. If, if we're not willing to, to take the next step and bring people up through it. Yeah. I think you bring up several good points. I, one of the points that you started out with was around kind of language too. And I think, oh, yeah. you know, somebody was just talking about this recently in the press around wine language and how it's so Eurocentric and, you know, why, you know, for those people that are in the wine industry that might be, you know, Haitian American or, you know, sure. whatever, however people identify, those weren't the smells or the flavors or the, you know, the spices that they were raised with. Totally right. Yeah. So there has to be some dismantling across the board in order for people to feel comfortable when they're sticking their nose into that glass yeah. to share. So I think it's, I mean, I'm fascinated by all of this. I think it should be really interesting to see how the industry moves particularly as you know we've been talking about this past year with covid and with technology and with kind of the doors being blown open about what it means to be um you know all the the, the stuff that's gone on with the quartermaster psalms and you know everything else that's happened in this past year where now people are using um social media as a mouthpiece for yeah. things that have to change. So it's, it's, I think it's a really fascinating time, fascinating time for the industry. Um, and also a time where, as you're saying, if these conversations aren't happening, then, whoa, I mean, are we all doomed or are brands going to be left behind or winery is going to be left behind? Uh, I think it's really interesting. The other thing, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about of, you know, there's some really cool wines that are coming out of certain places, but because that there lacks that foundational piece of education, you know, what consumer, unless they're being led to it is going to pick up like a piquette or like a pig pool de pine from somewhere, like unless they just, you know, it's, it's really hard. They're going to go back to probably the thing that's easiest, which is barefoot strawberry wine. Yeah, exactly right. So um, it's, yeah, it's really, really fascinating. You bring up a lot of good points. Is there anything else that, you know, we, we haven't talked about yet that we should have or anything that I should have asked you that I didn't? I mean, you could ask me what I did in my tasting yesterday and see what oh. no, sorry, that was. No. No, what, was say, what did um, you do in your tasting? I didn't even know about this. Um, <laughs> no. So, I, you know, I think other than the fact that I am, uh, you know, super excited to drink, uh, I, I like drinking, I like drinking a lot of different interesting wines. Um, and I'm super excited to kind of go through that experience of, of learning about new wines and the last couple of days I've been, um, the state of New York has been doing a tasting. Uh, we did a virtual vineyard uh, trip like this, which is not a vineyard trip. 
But it's been really interesting to see how the different regions of the U.S. have um, been leveraging technology to you know, tap into different global, ba global base and then sending the wines out to, to, to teach them about these places. But I think the reality is, you know, you really have to go, you have to visit, you have to meet the people, you have to touch the soil and kind of be part of that. Um, and I think that that's the next, you know, that may be the key to all of this back to kind of what we were talking about is creating these experiences that will help people get back together, but also get that value add. And so I'm, I'm hopeful with my business here that besides bringing really interesting, what I think are interesting wines, which is always key to making sure that you're successful is to recognize that it's what other people think about your wines and getting them there um, is, is building these experiences. So, it, you know, if I can bring more people from the UK over to the U S to either go to the Finger Lakes or go to the Hamptons or, you know, go up to Walla Walla or go out to somewhere in slow, uh, you know, Pismo Beach, Pismo Beach, or, you know, up to Cambria, just have these experiences, then that's, that's going to be, I think a big part of, you know, where we should go with all of this. So, other than the fact that I was drinking some interesting Trousseau and sign of some kind of some crazy Gewürztraminer and Riesling and uh, Cabernet Franc, I guess is the hot thing. And then I was drinking that Hamptons summer in a bottle from Woofer last night. Oh yeah. Which, but this is not, it's, it's fascinating wine and the guy's completely sold out. I mean, hundred percent sold out. So uh, I, you know, I just think you know, wine's big business and branding's big business. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we should be doing a, a good job of helping people understand that it's a real product where people work really hard on it and it should be a positive experience for you in your life. And that's my goal. Yeah, that's great. Any of the winemakers that you represent that you would like folks to look out for, especially here in California? Yeah, so my guy, Tyler Eck, um, who makes Dunites, um, they're based out of San Luis Obispo. He uh, is making some incredible wines. Um, his Chardonnay, Jesperson Ranch, he's just bringing out his El Moreno. He um, has these great Syrahs. Um, they're super clean and they are just beautiful. Really, I, I really am a big fan of Dunites. Uh, Seabold is up in um, Monterey. He's got some really interesting Chris Miller. He's He's actually just come on to the to the new court. Um, and he's just a really good dude and is really has been in winemaking for a long time and is really, really interesting. Um, I have a winemaker out of, um, Santa Cruz mountains. Uh, they are Sandra and Hem and there too, like the wines are just really clean, really small production. Um, and I know everybody's probably pretty familiar with the Sonoma guys, but I cannot say enough about Vanessa Wong, who's the winemaker at pay. Hey Vineyards, she, they do a Viognier, they do a Rue Saint Marcin, they've changed their Rue Saint Marcin into this thing called Von Blanc, and she only makes like 60 cases, and it is just killer. Uh, but they, their entire range, whether it's single vineyard Pinots or Syrahs, are, are awesome, and Andy's awesome. So yeah, those are those are four that I'm definitely pushing, but yeah, Dunites, check it out. He's, he's really great, Tyler, he's good dude. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to thank you for, um, for me and from our community here that uh, likes to learn more and really is going to be interested, I think, in the confluence between wine and technology and where the world is moving. We really appreciate your insights and your knowledge and, of course, your time, especially since we have such a big time difference. So Thank I you. really appreciate you being here. Um, and as we say here at Vino Karma, um, continue to go out there and create change one sip at a time. Cheers. Cheers.